The song had his beginning by his beginning. The Trinity doctrine teaches that the Son never had a beginning because the Son as the Son is supposed to have always co-eternally existed with the Father throughout eternity past. In contradistinction to the traditional Roman Catholic Trinity doctrine, the scriptures prove that the Son was not always a Son to the Father and that the Father was not always a Father to the Son because the Son is the man who was conceived in the Virgin, who had his beginning by his virgin conception and birth. Therefore, the whole Trinity idea of an alleged timeless God the Son without a beginning completely collapses in light of the scriptural evidence. The Father and Son relationship began in time. Hebrews 1.5 cites 2 Samuel 7.14 where the father said, I will be to him a father, and he, speaking of the son, will be to me a son. If a God the son was eternally at the father's side, as James White and other Trinitarian apologists have alleged, how then could the son have been literally alive at the father's anthropomorphic side, while the father prophetically spoke of his future son by saying, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. For how can any father have his own living son at his side while saying, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son? Such Trinitarian eisegesis of inspired texts contradicts many passages of inspired scripture, including the words of Christ himself when he said, As the father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son life in himself. John 5.26 Since the Son of God was granted a distinct life in himself, the Son could not have existed as a living Son before being granted that life by the Father through his virgin conception and birth. Now when you think about it, a co-equal God the Son could not be granted a distinct life in himself. Therefore, the Son, as the man, as the human being, was granted a distinct life in himself because God became a man. God became a human being with a distinct life in himself. That's why he's called the Son of God. Luke 135 says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And it was for that reason the child that would be conceived in the virgin would be called the Son of God. A foreknown son could not be timelessly foreknown. 1 Peter 1.20 proves that the son was foreknown before the foundation of the world. The Greek verb prognosko is defined as being known beforehand. How could a timeless son have literally existed while being known beforehand? If an angel appeared to a married couple and said, Your wife shall conceive and bear a son, then that son would be foreknown or known beforehand by that couple. Yet that couple could not say that their son literally existed before being foreknown. Therefore, a foreknown son could not have literally existed before being foreknown without the use of the word foreknown being rendered meaningless. Why would God choose the Greek verb prognosko for the Son being known beforehand if the Son always timelessly existed as a co-equal and co-eternal God the Son? The Son was begotten on a specific day. Psalm 2.7 says, You are my Son. This day have I begotten you. Our Heavenly Father said prophetically to His Son, because we know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was not literally begotten during the lifetime of King David when he wrote the second Psalm. So God the Father said, You are my Son this day. Have I begotten you? Both Strong's Concordance and the New American Standard Concordance say 
that yom means day, just like the English word day. In fact, not a single verse of scripture ever indicates that the Hebrew noun yom ever means a timeless day. Could Pharaoh of Egypt have given a timeless command to the Israelite slaves in Exodus chapter 5, which says, So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, You are no longer to give the people straw to make brick as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. So Exodus chapter 5 or 6 states, So the same day, the same Hebrew word, Yom is used for day, as in Psalm 2-7. This day have I begotten you. So it's hard to imagine that Pharaoh gave a command on a timeless day for the Israelites to have to go gather straw to make brick for themselves. That's ridiculous. So likewise, the Hebrew word Yom, meaning day in Psalm 2-7, would be ridiculous for the son to have been begotten on a timeless day. The same Hebrew verb yalad is used for the births of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4 verses 1 and 2, which proves that the son was born at a specific point in time rather than being eternally born or eternally begotten as Trinitarians falsely allege. The word begotten is simply a word that means being born. You cannot be eternally born which makes no sense whatsoever. So since the same Hebrew word Yalad is used for the births of Cain and Abel, as in Psalm 2, 7, which says, You are my son, this day have I given birth to you, it makes no sense for the son to have been timelessly given birth to. Since not a single verse of scripture ever indicates that the Hebrew word Yalad means being a timeless birth, we know that the Son of God had to have been begotten on a specific day. Therefore, the Son of God could not have always been a timeless Son because the Son was literally conceived and born as a true Son on a specific day. The Son was made Lord in Christ. Acts 2.36 proves that the Son of God was made both Lord and Christ by God the Father. The scripture says God has made this same Jesus both Lord and Christ in Acts 2.36. The word made is translated from the Greek verb payeho, which Strong's defines as to make, manufacture, construct, or to cause. It is hard to imagine that a timeless God the Son was made Lord or caused to be the Lord if he was already an alleged co-equal God, the Lord of the universe, to begin with. To be made both Lord and Christ is the same thing as saying that the Son was appointed the heir of all things. To be made Lord means to be appointed the Lord or caused to be the Lord over all things. So if the Son was appointed heir as the Lord of all things, how could the Son as a Son have already been the Lord? of all things before being appointed Lord of all things again a second time that makes no sense so the scripture says that the son was appointed heir of all things by God in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 Hebrews word studies defines Lord properly as a person exercising absolute ownership rights or Lord Lord likewise denotes an owner or master exercising full rights. So the Greek word kurios throughout the Greek scripture uh, can mean a master or a lord. It's not necessarily meaning God the Lord, but it usually means a master and lord, though sometimes kurios can be understood as being God, but most generally it speaks of, of the human lord or a human master throughout the Hebrew Bible when it's in the Septuagint and also in the Greek New Testament. So Kyrios means a master or lord. Therefore, the title Son of God refers to the man who was made Lord and Christ. Christ literally means anointed one, rather than to be an alleged, coically distinct, timeless God the Son person. The Son is the reproduced copy of the Father's person as a human person. Hebrews 1.3 states that the Son is the brightness of His glory, 
and the express image of his person. If the words of inspired scripture mean anything, then the Son cannot have always existed before being reproduced as the imprinted copy of the Father's person, because express image in the King James Version is translated from the Greek word character, which means a reproduction or an imprinted copy. You cannot be a timeless imprinted copy or a timeless reproduction from an original. Jesus was made as a son the express image of his, the Father's person, a reproduced, copied image of the Father's person as a human person. Luke one thirty five and Matthew one twenty prove that the Son was reproduced or copied from the Father's person or substance of being when the Holy Spirit descended upon the Hebrew Virgin to produce a man-child. Matthew 1.20 states that the Son was produced ek out of the Holy Spirit, and Galatians 4.4 4 states that the Son was produced ek out of the woman. Thus, inspired scripture calls Jesus both the mighty God and the everlasting Father, according to his divinity in Isaiah 9.6, from the Father's Holy Spirit, and the child born and son given, according to his humanity, from his mother Mary. Under Hebrews 1.3, the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature, 3rd edition, confirms that the Greek noun character used in Hebrews 1.3 proves that the Son is God the Father's, and I quote, produced reproduction, representation as, and I'm quoting again, a human being as the reproduction of of his, the Father's, own identity or reality. Christ is an exact representation of God's real being, Hebrews 1.3, end quote. So here we have the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature, 3rd edition, confirming that the Greek noun character used in Hebrews 1.3 proves that the Son of God is the Father's produced reproduction as a human being. He was reproduced as a human being of His, the Father's own identity or reality as God's real being reproduced as a human being. Since Hebrews 1.3 clearly states that the Son is the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person referencing the Father's person the Son must be the human being as the reproduction of His, the Father's own identity. Trinitarian theology alleges that a co-equally distinct, timeless God, the Son person, has always existed throughout eternity past. How then could an alleged timeless God, the Son, be the reproduced reproduction of God's real being as a human being, who is the reproduction of his, the Father's own identity, if the Son has always timelessly existed without being produced. Since the Greek lexicon show that Hebrews 1.3 in the original Greek proves that Jesus is a produced human being, ek, out of the Father's own identity, we know that the Son is the man who is God's real being, who became a human being in the incarnation through the Virgin. Thus, we can clearly see that Hebrews 1.3 is addressing the Son as the brightness of His glory and the express image of His, the Father's person, as a fully complete human person in the Incarnation within the Hebrew Virgin, rather than an alleged co-equal and co-eternal distinct timeless God the Son person. No Trinitarian apologist has ever been able to answer why Hebrews 1.3 uses the Greek noun character which shows that the Son was produced as an exact reproduction or copy of the Father's substance of being, while remaining timeless. For it is impossible for something to be reproduced or copied from an original without a specific time of origin. How then could the Son have always existed as an alleged timeless Son while being reproduced as the copy of the Father's person as a human being, a human person? So the Greek word noun character 
clearly proves that the sun was produced as a reproduction or copy of the father's hypostasis substance of being as a human being. Because a co-equal God person as a timeless God the Son cannot be reproduced, cannot be copied. Since Jesus is the copy of the Father's person as a human person, just like Colossians 1.15 says, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the image of the invisible God as the image of the invisible Father. Therefore, Jesus has to be the reproduced image of God the Father's substance of being copied as a fully complete human being. Now that makes sense. If we are to believe that God became a man, God's substance of being had to be reproduced or copied in order to become a human being because God is not ontologically a man. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man, nor is he a son of man. So Jesus is not ontologically God, the Father with us as the Father, in just a body of flesh. Jesus is God, the Father, who was made exactly like human brethren. He was made, according to Hebrews 2.17, fully human in every way, with a human spirit, fully complete human nature, human body, human will, so that Jesus could pray, Father, not my will, but your will be done. He didn't pray as a co-equal God, the Son person, saying, not my divine co-equal God, the Son person will. He was praying as a human being, just like he was tempted as a human being. God as God is not tempted of evil, neither does he tempt any man. God as God does not pray to God. So we know that the Son is the man who could pray and who could be tempted of the devil. Because God became a true man in the incarnation through the virgin, who had to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. God as God cannot grow in wisdom. God as God doesn't grow in stature. The Son is God with us as an authentic human being who began in time. Now this is so important. We must understand that God became a man in the incarnation through the Hebrew virgin. As an authentic human being who began in time. This explains how Jesus could pray and how he experienced temptation. If Jesus is God with us as God, then he could not be tempted of evil. He had to be copied. He had to be reproduced as a true human being, fully human in every way, according to Hebrews 2.17. Just as I have been criticized for agreeing with Arius' statement, now Arius was someone in church history uh, in the early 4th century, who believed that Jesus, the Son of God, was created like an angelic creation before his virgin conception. And so Arius believed that the Son had a beginning of in time by being created up in heaven. Okay, so I have been criticized uh, for agreeing with Arius' statement when he said, there was a time when the sun did not exist. I've been criticized by uh, Trinitarian apologist Ethan Smith in my debate with him entitled, Is Jehovah Tripersonal or Unipersonal? So also, Trinitarian apologist Edward Delcor criticized Oneness author David K. Bernard for teaching like Arius that there was a time when the sun did not exist in his book, A Definitive Look at Oneness Theology. Dr. David Bernard wrote, there was a time when the sun did not exist in the Oneness of God, page 105. Trinitarian author Edward Delcor condemned David Bernard for rejecting the pre-existence of the sun and for using a phrase comparable to the key phrase in Arius' teaching. There was a time when he, the Son, was not. There's a direct quote in A Definitive Look at Oneness Theology by Edward Delcor, page 108, against Dr. David K. Bernard. But we notice that Edward Delcor didn't bother to mention the doctrinal distinction between Arianism and Oneness. Arius taught that the sun had a beginning in time because the sun was created like an angelic figure in heaven. While the oneness teaching believes that the sun had its beginning by his virgin conception and birth, by his beginning. The sun existed in the mind and plan of God as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, as the beginning of the creation of God, 
as the firstborn of all creation, Colossians 1.15. He was the beginning of the creation of God in God's prophetic mind and plan, just as the Son wasn't literally the Lamb slain from the creation of the world. Likewise, Jesus wasn't literally born before the creation of the world. He was born and conceived and slain in the mind and foreknowledge of God, in God's prophetic blueprint, before he actually began creating the world. While oneness theology can agree with the key phrase of Arius, there was a time when the sun was not, we differ from Arius in that we believe that he who became the sun has always pre-existed his virgin conception and birth as the mighty God and as the everlasting Father, before also becoming incarnate as a true man. Hence, oneness theology affirms the deity of the God who became a child born and son given, while Arius completely denied the deity of Christ. So there's a big difference between oneness theology and Arianism, which is similar to the Jehovah's Witness doctrine. Therefore, while we deny Arius' rejection of the timeless existence of the Holy Spirit of the Father, who descended upon the Virgin to become incarnate as the Son, we agree with Arius in that the Son as a Son was never an eternal Son with no beginning. Because the Son is the man who had his beginning by his begetting. So we agree with Arius that the Son had a beginning, but we do not believe with Arius that the Son was created up in heaven as an angel. We don't believe that whatsoever. And we believe that the Son is not just a man. He's fully God incarnate with us as a man. So we believe in the full deity of Christ and the full humanity of Christ. Oneness theology believes that the Son of God lived an authentic human life because the Son is the Holy Spirit of God the Father who also became the man who was formed in the Hebrew Virgin. Thus, the Son of God is not God living with humanity as God, but rather, the Son of God is God living with humanity as a true man living among men. Since it is impossible for God as God to pray to God, and for God as God to be tempted of evil as God, we know that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is God incarnate with us as a genuine human being, who was made exactly like all humans are made. The following excerpts are from J.L. Hall's article in the Pentecostal Herald, a United Pentecostal Church publication. Did Jesus pray to himself? No, not when we understand that Jesus was both God and man. In his deity, Jesus did not pray, for God does not need to pray to anyone. As a man, Jesus prayed to God, not to his humanity, he did not pray to himself as humanity, but to the one true God, to the same God who dwelled in his humanity and who also inhabits the universe. End quote. Brother Hall went on to write in the same publication, and I quote, Biblical facts reveal that Jesus lived as an authentic human being, that he did not merely assume the appearance of flesh. Therefore, we should not be surprised that he prayed to God seeking strength, guidance, and assurance. Moreover, we should not be surprised that Jesus had a will distinct from God, and that he was truly human in spirit and soul, that he possessed a self-awareness of his humanity. Notice, he was truly human in his spirit and soul. He possessed a self-awareness of his humanity. Jesus' prayers to God the Father came from his human life from the Incarnation. His prayers were not those of one divine person to another divine person of God, but those of an authentic human praying to the one true God. Prayer is based on an inferior being in supplication before a superior being. If the one praying is equal in power and authority to the one to whom he is praying, there is no genuine prayer. End quote. Oneness theology clearly teaches that God became a genuine human being in the incarnation through the Virgin 
who lived as an authentic human being. This explains the prayers and temptations of Jesus Christ as a true man living among men. Therefore, oneness theologians acknowledge that Jesus Christ is both God Almighty as to his true divine identity and fully man as to his true human identity because God himself became a man within the Hebrew virgin. Oneness author Talmadge French affirmed that God became a man in the incarnation through the virgin. At 9 minutes and 40 seconds into Dr. Talmadge French's lecture on oneness Pentecostalism in global perspective, Talmadge French said, How did God become a man and yet remain God? Notice he said, How did God become a man and yet remain God? How is God the Father, Son, and Spirit and yet one God? It is an awesome revelation. End quote. So we can see here that Brother French, Talmadge French, stated that God became a man. That's what oneness theology teaches. The one true God, our only true God, according to John 17, 3, is our Heavenly Father. Jesus prayed to his Heavenly Father as the only true God. And so, the only true God is the Father who became a man. Oneness author Dr. Daniel Seagraves wrote that Jesus is God manifested in genuine and full human existence. And I quote, Everything that Jesus did and said, he did and said as who he was. God manifest in genuine and full human existence. End quote. Dr. Daniel Seagraves wrote that Jesus Christ as the Son of God was God manifested in genuine and full human existence. Not half a human existence, but a fully complete human existence. That's the same thing as God becoming a man. So oneness theologians, and these Dr. Daniel Seagraves has a doctorate degree, very educated man, same with Dr. Talmadge French, Dr. David K. Bernard. These are very educated men in the oneness movement that are that have written books that all say that God became a man who lived an authentic human life. William Chalfant is a respected oneness author who wrote the following in a critique of Bible writers' theology. And I quote, If Jesus Christ is not God Almighty, then he is not able to save us. On the other hand, if Jesus of Nazareth is not the true Son of Mary, and a genuine human being, descended from David and Abraham, then he cannot be our Redeemer and our sacrifice for sins. To deny his wonderful divinity is to rob him of his rightful glory. On the other hand, to deny his genuine humanity is to rob us of our blood sacrifice, who hung in our place on that old rugged cross. If he is not one of us, then we do not have a true mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5 states, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. If he was not true Anthropos and true God, then our faith is in vain. Anthropos simply means a man. If he was not true man and true God, then our faith is in vain. But it is not in vain because he stood in my place. End quote. At approximately 23 minutes and 45 seconds into David Bernard's debate with Dr. Robert Morey, Brother Bernard stated, when we speak of Jesus conversing with the Father, it is understandable that Jesus was speaking as an authentic human being. And at 23 minutes and 13 seconds into the same debate, Dr. Bernard said that the prayers of Jesus were, and I'm quoting, always in the context of a real human life. Then at approximately 24 minutes and 30 seconds, Brother Bernard said, and I'm quote, you must understand that it was as a real human being that he, speaking of Jesus, submitted his will to God, end quote. From David K. Bernard's debate with Dr. Robert Morey, 
from YouTube. The oneness theological position does not teach that Jesus ever prayed to the Father as the Father, as our position affirms that Jesus prayed and submitted his human will to the Father as a real human being only after his incarnation as a true man from the Hebrew Virgin. Hence, God the Father was able to operate as the unchangeable God outside of the incarnation with only one divine will, while the child born and son given is God the Father with us as an authentic human being who prayed in the context of a real human life with a real genuine human will. If we are to believe that God became a man, it's ridiculous to say that Jesus didn't have a human will. Thus we have one divine God person as our Heavenly Father and one mediator between that God person and all humanity, the man Christ Jesus. For the only true God also became an authentic human being as a human person because one person as one person cannot mediate or interact with himself. Therefore, Dr. David Bernard's theological position is the same theological position as mine even though Trinitarian apologist Ethan Smith has claimed that I have contradicted oneness theology, because I have stated that the Father's person also became a fully complete human person, God as one divine person and as one human person. So in a sense, that's two persons. We got one divine person as our Heavenly Father, and our Heavenly Father became one person, a human person. So we got one divine person who became one human person. So we got one God person and one man person. One God, the Father, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. One God, one man. But what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that there are two divine persons. I'm not saying that Jesus' person is not the person of the Father. Jesus is the divine person of the Father with us as a fully complete human person. So that's what I mean by two persons. I mean one divine person is our Heavenly Father, and one human person is the Son of God, because the Father's divine person became a human person in the Incarnation through the Virgin. I'm not saying that there are two separate persons here that are not the same person. No, I'm saying that the human person, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, is the divine person of God the Father who became a human person. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that Jesus is a separate person uh, like the Trinitarians would believe. I'm not saying that Jesus Christ is a separate person like Unitarian Sicinians would believe. I'm saying that Jesus Christ is God the Father ontologically with us as a human being, with an authentic human life, who could pray, who could be tempted, who had to have a personal relationship with his Heavenly Father. I have found that most non oneness people erroneously think we believe that Jesus is God the Father with us as God the Father, rather than God the Father living with us as a genuine human being. Thus they laugh and ridicule our position before taking the time to honestly examine what our position really is. We are not alleging that Jesus is merely God in the flesh. We are affirming that Jesus is God with us as a genuine man in the flesh who could pray with a human will, be tempted by the devil as an authentic human being. The Son never possessed the divine name of Yahweh until it was given to him. The Trinity doctrine states that an alleged God the Son has always co-equally and co-eternally ruled as a distinct individual with God the Father. This would mean that an alleged God the Son should have possessed the name of Yahweh or Jehovah along with the Father throughout eternity past. But if the scriptures prove that the Son as the Son never possessed the name of Yahweh before it was given to him, then the whole Trinity doctrine collapses. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 says, I will raise to David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign. And this is his name whereby he shall be called Yahweh, our righteousness. Notice the text says, his name shall be called Yahweh, our righteousness. It wasn't always called Yahweh as a son. The son's name was given to him. His name is the father's name, Yahweh. We know that the context of Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 is addressing Jesus Christ as the righteous branch who came from the seed of David. Since Christ would be called Yahweh, 
in the prophetic future, we know that Christ Jesus as a son could not have always been called Yahweh as a son throughout eternity past. For why would the scriptures say that Christ shall be called Yahweh if he was always timelessly called Yahweh to begin with? Matthew 1, 21-23 says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, which means Yahweh is salvation. For he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The name of Jesus in Hebrew literally means Yahweh or Jehovah is salvation. Notice that the context in Matthew chapter 1, 21 through 23 states that the son would be called Jesus, Yahweh is salvation, rather than the Son always being called Yahweh our Savior throughout eternity past. Therefore, we know that the Son is the man who had to be given the name of Yahweh because of his beginning by his virgin beginning. In other words, the Son is the man who had his beginning by his beginning. But the God who became the man has always been Yahweh. The Son is given the name of Yahweh as his own name because the Son is had a beginning as a human life, a human son. God has not always been a son because the title son of God and the title son of man means a son of mankind, a human child born and human son given, not a co-equal divine God the son person. The scriptures repeatedly inform us that the son is the man Christ Jesus who was given the name of Yahweh God the Father rather than always possessing that divine name. John 5.43, Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name. John 17.11, Jesus prayed, Holy Father, keep them through your name, the name which you have given me. Notice, your name, he addressed the Father. The name which you have given me. So the Father's name was given to the Son. Philippians 2.9, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Notice, the Father God gave the Son, the man, the name that is above every name. What other name other than Yahweh or Jehovah is the name above every name? So Jesus was given the Father's name. Hebrews 1.4 says, He has by inheritance obtained a name more excellent than they. The context proves the angels. So the son is the man who by inheritance obtained a name more excellent than the angels. We ask our Trinitarian friends why the son would come in his father's name in John 5.43 if the son is the name of an alleged second divine person of an alleged three-person trinity. For if the Son is co-equally the second God person of the Trinity, then he would have to come in his own co-equally distinct name rather than the Father's name. In like manner, if the Son as a Son has always possessed the name that is above every name, then how could the Son be given the Father's name while always possessing it? Does that make sense? The Son was given the name of the Father while always possessing it? Therefore, the Son had to have obtained the name above all names because the Son is the man Christ Jesus rather than an alleged timeless God the Son. A Son is a man and a man is a Son and a Son has to have a beginning. A Son has to have a creation, a beginning as a real human life. The scriptural evidence which proves that the Son was given the Father's name explains why the apostles always baptized in the name of Jesus Christ alone. Acts 2.38, Acts 8.16, Acts 10.48, Acts 19.5, Romans 6.3-5, Colossians 2.12, Galatians 3.27 all speak of baptism into the name of Christ, the Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ. We never find a single baptism where the scripture says that 
a person was actually baptized saying Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because the apostles rightly understood the command of Christ to baptize in the name, a single name. And the name of Jesus is the name of the Father. I've come in my Father's name. Holy Father, keep them through your name, the name which you've given me. So the name of the Father was given to the Son. Jesus' name literally means Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh saves. Christ Jesus has by human inheritance received the divine name of his Father because the Son is Emmanuel, God with us as a true man living among men. Thus, Matthew 28, 19 proves that there is only one divine name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus has that name, which is the name of the mighty God and everlasting Father. Matthew 28, 19 says, baptizing them in the name. The Greek text is a noma, which means a single name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So, the name of the son, child-born son given, is the name of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew 1.23 Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew 1.23 confirms the prophecy in Isaiah 7.10-14 was fulfilled in Jesus, because Jesus is Emmanuel, which is translated as God with us. Thus, Isaiah 9, 6 is a prophecy predicting that the name of the child born and son given would be called the same name as the mighty God and everlasting Father. That is why the prophet Jeremiah wrote that the son shall be called, in the future tense, Yahweh, our righteousness. In Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. An alleged God the son should have always been called Yahweh throughout eternity past. And this is why Psalm 118, 14 says, Yahweh is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. The Son is the predestined Lord of the universe. Hebrews 1, 2 in the Weymouth New Testament translation says, God, who in ancient days spoke to our forefathers in many distinct messages and by various methods through the prophets, has at the end of these days spoken to us through a son. Notice, God at the end of these days, the last days, has spoken to us through a son, who is the predestined Lord of the universe and through whom he made the ages. Aeonus means ages, not worlds. Ages is time periods. Oneness author Dr. Daniel Seagraves wrote, the statement that God has in these last days spoken to us by his son which contrasts with God's prior communication through the prophets indicates grammatically that God has not spoken by his son prior to these last days if we could use son in a pre-incarnational sense it would be incredible to think that God never spoke by the Son from all eternity and throughout the entire era of the Hebrew Scriptures until the Incarnation. End quote. So here we see from Dr. Daniel Seagraves, a oneness theologian with a doctorate degree, very educated man. He states that the Son did not speak until these last days. Grammatically, in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, we find that the Son didn't say anything as a Son until these last days, which is incredible to think that a, a pre-incarnate God the Son never spoke from all eternity past throughout the entire era of the Hebrew Scriptures until the Incarnation? That's incredible. It's like the Son was gagged for eternity past and then he was unveiled and allowed to speak after the Incarnation. That makes no sense whatsoever. A co-equal God the Son should have been equally speaking along with the Father and the Holy Spirit if the Trinity Doctrine was true. 
Trinitarian apologists often allege that a God the Son could be seen as one of the angels who spoke to the Israelite forefathers in the Old Testament, even though Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 states that God has not spoken to us through a Son until the end of these days. If the Son of God actually spoke to the Israelite forefathers prior to the last days, then why does Hebrews 1, 2 say that God, who in ancient days spoke to our forefathers in many distinct messages, and by various methods through the prophets, has at the end of these days, or in these last days, spoken to us through a son, who is the predestined Lord of the universe. Peter cited Joel 2.28 and Acts 2.17 to show that the first century was the beginning of the last days. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. The day of Pentecost was when the Holy Spirit was first poured out. God the Father the Spirit was poured out upon all flesh, and that was the beginning of the last days. So the Son, as a Son, did not speak to us until these last days. If the Son has always existed as a timeless, coequal, and eternal God the Son, then it seems strange that such a God the Son would have been completely silent until these last days. No Trinitarian can explain why there is not a single verse of scripture to show that the Son as a God the Son ever actually spoke in the Hebrew Scriptures. It also seems very strange that the predestined Lord of the universe could have actually created the human ages as the Father's agent while being foreknown, predestined, and appointed by God the Father as the one who is the predestined heir of all things, according to Hebrews 1-2, and who is appointed the, over the works of his, the Father's, hands. For how is it possible for an alleged pre-incarnate God the Son to have been appointed the heir of all things, if that God the Son was already a co-equal ruler over all things to begin with? In like manner, an alleged co-equal God the Son should not have been appointed over the works of the Father's hands if the Son as the Son actually did the creating as the Father's agent in creation. Hebrews 2.7 and Psalm 8.6 proves that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was appointed to rule over the works of the Father's hands. You can't be appointed to rule over the works of the Father's hands if, if a God the Son did the creating as a Son. That means the Father did all the creating and appointed the Son as the ruler over the works of His hands. The Son became better than the angels as He inherited the Father's name. Hebrews 1.4 Having become as much better than the angels as He has inherited a more excellent name than they. Notice the words having become better than the angels. How exactly could an alleged timeless and co-equal God the Son have become better than the angels if he was already better than the angels as a co-equal God the Son to begin with? In like manner, how could an alleged timeless and co-equal God the Son be said to have inherited a more excellent name than they, the angels, if he has already had that name throughout eternity past. Furthermore, since Trinitarian theologians have traditionally alleged that the title Son is the name of a timeless God the Son, how exactly could the Son have inherited his name as the Son if he has always had that name throughout eternity past? Trinitarians often state that Matthew 28, 19, to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit are three names of the Trinity. That the Son is the name, one of the three names of the Trinity. Well, that, that couldn't be correct. Because, first of all, Son is not a name. It says the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, singular. Jesus was given the Father's name. Therefore, the Son's name is the Father's name. But Trinitarians are alleging that the Son is the name of a God the Son, and that we need to baptize in all three names of the Trinity, which is totally ridiculous. God the Father commanded the angels to worship the Son in the world. 
Hebrews 1, 6. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Again, Jesus Christ was the firstborn of all creation, just like he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God created in his mind and plan, his plan, the firstborn of all creation. So Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all creation. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So when the son was, the firstborn was brought into the world, it was in the mind and plan of God that God calls the things as be not as though they already were. So the Son is called the firstborn of all creation. When he brings the firstborn into the world, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. Now think about it. Why would God say, let all the angels of God worship the Son, if the Son already existed as a Son in the first place? How could Trinitarians believe that a co-equal and co-eternal timeless God the Son was a pre-incarnate God the firstborn before actually being born? That makes no sense. Can God as God literally be a God the firstborn before he was actually born? The only viable understanding of the word firstborn in relation to Christ Jesus is is that he was first born in the prophetic mind and planning of God, just as he was already called the Lamb slain for the foundation of the world in Revelation 13.8. Therefore, the God who calls the things which be not as though they were, had already spoke of Christ as being first slain and first born before he was actually slain and born. The Son of God is also called the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation in Colossians 1.15, before the Son was actually born. Hence, God literally brought forth his firstborn into the world after the Son was foreknown before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1.20 For why else would the angels have been commanded to worship the Son after being brought into the world if the angels were already worshiping the Son as an alleged pre-incarnate God, the firstborn, to begin with? Therefore, the Son could not have timelessly existed as a God the Son because the angels would not have been commanded to worship the Son if they had always been worshiping the Son as the Son in the first place. The Son is Yahweh incarnate who will sit on the throne of David. Hebrews 1, 8, 9 says, But unto the Son, your throne, O God, is to the age of the age, and the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and have hated wickedness. Because of this God, your God has anointed you with the oil of exaltation above your companions. Notice Hebrews 1.8 says, But unto the Son your throne, O God. It doesn't say, But unto the Son he says. We know that Hebrews 1, 8, 9 is a direct quote from a messianic prophecy found in Psalm 45, 6, and 7, in which the future child born and son given would love righteousness and hate wickedness after being conceived and born on planet Earth. For it is impossible for a co-equal God the Son to have a God. Your God has anointed you, while being anointed by His God above His human companions. In like manner, it is ridiculous to assert that a co-equal God the Son could be anointed by his God, as he who anoints is greater than he who is anointed. A pre-incarnate God the Son cannot be anointed, because he who anoints is greater than he is anointed. That would make Jesus like an Aryan son, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, and not a co-equal son. The Berean literal Bible excludes he says. It says, but unto the Son, your throne, O God. It doesn't say, but unto the Son, he says. The Berea literal Bible excludes he says from the text of Hebrews 1.8 because it does not appear in any of the original Greek manuscripts. Now, this is significant. Throughout Hebrews chapter 1, we find he says, he says, he says. But then when we come to Hebrews 1.8, but unto the Son, it doesn't say he says. And since it does not appear in any of the Greek manuscripts, 
we know there's a reason why the scripture excludes he says. So the literal Berean Bible has it a correct translation when it says, but unto the Son and excludes he says. But unto the Son it says, your throne, O God. But unto the Son, your throne, O God. It doesn't say, but unto the Son, he says. It's significant. Because no Greek manuscript says he says. Hence, the Trinitarian idea that God the Father actually spoke to his Son, saying, your throne, O God, is entirely speculative and without any evidential scriptural support. Many translations italicize he says because the words were added later by the translators. They do not appear in the Greek text. In fact, since Hebrews 1, 8, 9 is a direct messianic quote from the psalmist's song in Psalm 45, 6, and 7, we know that God was not directly speaking the words in Psalm 45, 6, and 7. Thus, it would be more scripturally accurate to add the scripture says in italics to Hebrews 1 8 rather than he says now in the past I have produced videos and I never knew this I just came across this recently I thought it said he says so this is very significant because it points to the fact that the father didn't actually speak these words in Hebrews 1 8 it just of course the psalmist by inspiration was led to write but of the Son, your throne, O God. But it doesn't say the Father says. The context of Psalm chapter 45 is a song from one of the sons of Korah addressing the Messiah as the king in an inspired messianic prophecy. Here's the text in Psalm 45, verse 1. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I, speaking of the psalmist, not God the Father, I address my verses to the king my tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. Verse 3. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. This is speaking of the Messiah. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. End quote. This is the passage that is cited in Hebrews 1, 8, 9. Benson's commentary indicates that the psalmist was the individual who composed the words in Psalm chapter 45, rather than God the Father speaking directly to his Son. Benson's commentary explains the Hebrew meaning of the psalmist's words in Psalm 45.1. And I quote, I will speak of the things I have made, Hebrew, my work or composition. In other words, the psalmist said it was his work or his composition, touching the king, the king Messiah and his government. While the Spirit of God inspired the psalmist to write Psalm chapter 45, we know that it was the psalmist who wrote, I address my verses to the king in a psalm or a song, rather than God the Father directly speaking to his future child born and son given. For if God the Father was speaking directly to his son, saying, Your throne, O God, then how can God the Father also say, Therefore God, your God, has anointed you? Obviously, God didn't say, God, your God has anointed you. Thus, we know that the psalmist was inspired to address the Messiah as God, who would ascend to the throne of David, which inspired scripture identifies as the throne of Yahweh, and the throne of God and of the Lamb in Revelation 22, 3. Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, then moves on to citing a completely different psalm, out of Psalm 102, 25 through 27, in which the psalmist is praying to his creator, saying, verse 24, I say, the psalmist said, I say, O my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Notice, 
the psalmist is praying, saying, Oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old, the psalmist continues praying, of old, the psalmist says, You founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure, and all of them will wear out like a garment. Your, like clothing, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. End quote. Anyone who reads Psalm chapter 102 in its entirety will clearly see that the entire chapter is a prayer of the psalmist to Yahweh, God as his king, asking for help. Psalm 102.1 says, Hear my prayer, O Yahweh, and let my cry for help come to you. Hence, the psalmist who said, O my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days, goes on to pray, Of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. We know that Hebrews 1.10 addresses the Father's hands as Hebrews 2.7 cites Psalm 8, 5, and 6 to show that the Father appointed the Son over the works of His hands. Psalm 8, 5, and 6 says, You crown Him with glory and honor and appointed Him, the Son, over the works of your hands. This is cited in Hebrews 2.7 referencing Jesus Christ as the one who is appointed to rule over the works of the Father's hands. Thus, we can clearly see that Hebrews 1.10 cites Psalm 102.25 to show that Jesus is the Creator as Yahweh God the Father before He became the human child born and son given. Hebrews 1.10-12 says, And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And all will grow old like a garment, and like a robe you will roll them up, and like a garment they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will never end. One of theologians agree that the true identity of the Son is the Spirit of Yahweh God the Creator before the Holy Spirit became manifest or incarnate as a human child born and son given. In contradistinction, Trinitarians falsely assume that Hebrews 1, 10-12 is addressing a coically distinct pre-incarnate Yahweh God the Son person who created all things as a son. Yet there is not a shred of scriptural evidence to suggest that the son pre-existed his birth as the son because the scriptures only speak of Yahweh God the Father as the creator who made him Lord over the works of your hands. We ask Trinitarians how the son could have been the father's agent in creation while the son has been made Lord over the works of the Father's hands. Hebrews 2 7 cites Psalm 8 5 and 6 to prove that the Son has been appointed over the works of the Father's hands. You have made him for a little while lower than the angels, you crowned him with glory and honor, and have appointed him over the works of your hands. Hebrews 2 7. Some have alleged that Psalm 8 5 and 6 in Hebrews 2 7 is not addressing Jesus as the one who has been appointed over the works of the Father's hands. But Hebrews 2, 8, 9 goes on to clearly affirm that this passage is speaking about Jesus Christ. You have put all things in subjection under His feet. For in subjecting all things to Him, He left nothing that is not subject to Him. But now we do not yet see all things subject to Him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. End quote. So we know that the subject of the person who is the one appointed over the works of the Father's hands is Jesus Christ. All things are put under the Son's feet, namely Jesus Christ. Therefore, the text proves that the Son was made a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor, and he was appointed over the works of the Father's hands. Trinitarian apologists cannot explain how the Son created all things as a Son while being appointed over the works of the Father's hands. The only viable explanation is held by oneness believers. 
While the Son is the man who has been appointed over the works of the Father's hands, he who became a man as the child born and son given is the Father himself incarnate as a true man. Hebrews 3, 3 and 4 confirms the fact that the true identity of the Son is Yahweh God the Creator before he became a son as the man Christ Jesus. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who builded the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Notice how the subject of the text is Jesus as a man who is counted worthy of more glory than Moses because he built all things as God before becoming the child born and the son given. The text does not state that the son built all things as the son. The text clearly states that Jesus is the true divine identity who built all things as God before becoming a human son. I'll read it again. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. So Jesus is counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who has built the house has more honor than the house. Now that means Jesus is the one who built all things. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. So this proves that Jesus Christ built all things as God before he became a man, before he became a son. The Son is the man who ascended to the right hand of God, Yahweh. Hebrews 1.13 says, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet? The inspired author of Hebrews cited a portion of Psalm 110.1 to show that Jesus Christ is the one addressed in a prophecy referencing his ascension into heaven. Psalm 110.1 in the Hebrew text shows that Yahweh spoke prophetically to David's Lord, the Messiah as a human Lord, saying, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. Psalm 110.1 in its entirety says, The Lord said to my Lord. In the actual Hebrew, it says, Yahweh said to my Adon. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. It doesn't say Yahweh said to my Yahweh. It said Yahweh said to my Adon, which means a master or a lord. Notice that the divine name Yahweh appears in the text for the Most High God, who speaks to another lord, which is the Hebrew noun Adon, or Adonai. Adon, or Adonai, is normally used of human masters and human lords throughout the Hebrew Bible, but rarely used in reference to the Most High God himself. Thus, the normative use of Adonai in the context of being distinguished from Yahweh in Psalm 110.1 indicates that the only true God is our Heavenly Father, who prophetically spoke of his future child born and son given as the human Adonai, the human Lord who would be exalted to his anthropomorphic right hand in the prophetic future. Acts 2, 34-35 proves that Psalm 110.1 is a messianic prophecy about the ascension of the man Christ Jesus into heaven because the apostle Peter cited Psalm 110.1 to prove that Jesus ascended into heaven in his resurrected body. And I quote Acts 2, 34-35. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord, Yahweh, said unto my Lord, Adonai, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Here we find, through the inspired apostle, that Psalm 110.1 refers to the Messiah's bodily ascension into heaven. It was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself said, Yahweh said to my Adonai, my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. So it wasn't David who ascended into heaven. It was Jesus, the Son of God, who ascended into heaven. That's why he cited Psalm 110.1. Yahweh, the Lord, said unto my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. 
So we find that the apostle cited Psalm 110.1 referring to the Messiah's bodily ascension into heaven in which the Son would be exalted to the highest position of authority under God the Father himself. We ask our Trinitarian friends how God the Father could have said to a co-equally distinct Yahweh God the Son before the Incarnation, sit at my right hand, if the Son was already at the Father's anthropomorphic right hand to begin with. Therefore, we can see that the Son of God is the man who had his beginning by his virgin beginning. Whilst the God who became the Son as a true man among men could never have had a time of origin. Yahweh God became a Son in order to save us. When we read the entire chapter of Psalm 118 in context, we find that Yahweh became our salvation as Jesus by becoming the child born and the Son given. This is the gate of Yahweh, the righteous will enter through it. I shall give thanks to you, for you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is Yahweh's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus cited Psalm 118.23, referencing himself, which proves that Jesus is Yahweh, who has become our salvation by his own Holy Spirit, who descended upon the virgin, to become the Christ child. Therefore Jesus proved that he is Yahweh God incarnate as the Messiah when he said, Have you not even read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone? This came about from Yahweh, the Lord. It is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to seize him, yet they feared the people. The Pharisees not only perceived that Jesus had spoken the previous parable against them, but were obviously familiar with the context of Psalm 118, which says that Yahweh would become our salvation. Thus, when Jesus cited Psalm 118 about himself, the Pharisees became enraged at Jesus and sought to kill him because they assumed that he had also spoken blasphemy by claiming to be Yahweh himself. Therefore, the Pharisees could not accept the fact that Jesus is Yahweh who became our salvation as Emmanuel, God with us as a true man. Jesus is honored to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2.10-11 informs us that all of humanity will one day bow to Jesus and to confess him as Lord. But Isaiah 45.23 shows that the Father is the speaker who says that all of humanity will bow and swear to him. The context proves the Father as Lord or Yahweh. Philippians 2, 9 and 11 says, God highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Yahweh is the only name above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, which means Yahweh saves, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice, Jesus is honored to the glory of God the Father. This is very important. The context of Isaiah 45, 21 through 23 shows that Yahweh God is the speaker who says, declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord, or Yahweh? And there is none other but God beside me, a righteous God and a Savior? There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other, no other Savior. No other God our Savior. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness. And will not turn back. That to me every knee will bow. Every tongue will swear allegiance. Anyone who compares the context of Isaiah 45.23 with Philippians 2.9 and 11 should clearly see that to bow the knee to Jesus 
and confess him as Lord, the context proves at the end of this age, is to bow the knee to the Father and confess that the Father is Lord. We don't bow to Jesus as a separate God the Son to the glory of God the Son and the glory of God the Father. All glory is to the Father himself. Hence, all bowing and confessing Jesus as Lord at the end of this age is all to the glory of God the Father alone rather than to the glory of two other alleged co-equal members of a trinity. So many scriptures to back this up. Isaiah 45, 14, 15 says that men will bow to the Messiah saying, Surely God is in you. There is none else. There is no God. Truly you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel the Savior. There is no other God. Truly you are a God who hides yourself, O God of Israel the Savior. So, who else but God the Father is the God of Israel? And who else but God the Father is the Savior of all humanity? Zechariah 14, 9. And Yahweh shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Yahweh and his name one. There's not two or three Yahweh God persons. There's not two or three Yahweh God names. No, there's only one Yahweh as a self-existent one and his name is one. His name is Yahweh. Jesus' name is the name of the Father, Yahweh saves. This is not what we would expect if the Son is a coically distinct true God person beside the Father. For why would bowing the knee to Jesus and confessing him as Lord be to the glory of God the Father? If the Son is a coically distinct true God person, then the Son should also have his own divine glory and dignity rather than just the Father. The words of Isaiah 45, 23 in context prove that Yahweh God the Father is the speaker who said, The word has gone forth from my mouth. Jesus is the word, the Lagos of the Father. The word has gone forth from my mouth, the Father's mouth, in righteousness, and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow, Every tongue will swear allegiance. The context of Isaiah 45, 23 proves that the Father is the speaker who said that his word has gone forth from his mouth, the Father's mouth. Since the Son of God is clearly the word that has gone forth out of the Father's mouth, it is nonsensical to believe that a timelessly co-equal true God person could have gone forth from the Father's anthropomorphic mouth while being timeless and co-equal. Therefore, the Son of God existed as the Logos of God the Father, as the Father's expressed thought that was later made flesh to become the Christ child. Since Philippians chapter 2, 10 and 11 cites Isaiah 45, 23, we know that to bow and confess Jesus as Lord is to bow and swear to me, to the Father. John 14, 24 proves that Jesus is the Father's Word, the Father's Logos, who has gone forth from the Father's own mouth. So when every knee bows and confesses Jesus Christ as Lord, we know that all are bowing and confessing Jesus Christ as Yahweh. It proves that the deity in Jesus is the deity of the Father who gets all the glory. For if Jesus was a co-equally distinct divine person, then the scriptures would say, to the glory of the Son and the Father. In other words, all the glory shouldn't go to the Father, we should have glory going to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as two other God persons. But no, all glory goes to God the Father because the Son is the manifestation of the Father in the flesh. And the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit in action of the Father's presence and power. The Father gets all the glory because the Son is the brightness of His, the Father's glory, and the express image of His, the Father's person, as a fully complete human person. Hebrews 1.3 Furthermore, how could the Son as the Son have always existed as an alleged Yahweh God the Son person while the name of Yahweh was bestowed upon Him at a specific point in time? God highly exalted Him and bestowed on him the name which is above every day. Can God 
as a true God person be given or bestowed the name of Yahweh while always eternally existing as a timeless and co-equal true God person distinct from the Father to begin with? Therefore, the Trinitarian idea of a timeless God the Son cannot harmonize with Philippians 2.9 and other scriptures which state that the Son was given the Father's name in time. God became a man. In conclusion, while the Son is the man who had his beginning by his virgin begetting, Hebrews 2.14-17 proves that the he who partook of flesh and blood is Yahweh God, who has become our salvation by being made as a fully complete human son out of the Holy Spirit. The, the texts in Matthew chapter 120 state that Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is ek out of the Holy Spirit and ek out of the Virgin Mary. Galatians 4.4 4. So, Yahweh God became our salvation by being made as a fully complete human son out of the Holy Spirit and out of the Virgin Mary in order to save his people from their sins. Hence the Father's own name, Yahweh, was given to the Son at a specific point in time because the angel gave the Son's name to Joseph. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus means Yahweh saves. For he will save his people from their sins. Therefore the Holy Spirit of the only true God miraculously became a man. As the child born and son given within the virgin in order to save his people from their sins. For more videos you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit us on the web at apostolicchristianfaith.com. God bless.